And, and nah, come on, man. Yo, yo. What? All right, we got Myron Gaines on the line. Hey, what's up, bro? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can hear you loud and clear, chat. Uh, as promised, you know, I have a, a, a former federal um, law enforcement agent, also a friend of mine, Myron Gaines from the, you know, co-host of the Fresh and Fit podcast. He's here. Um, I told you I was going to bring him on. He has additional insight, not only how these investigations are usually conducted. Um, he could probably give us some more insight on not, uh, um, how these, you know, obviously it's a high profile arrest, how these are uh, these cases are presented to the U.S. attorney and s such forth. Uh, essentially, you know, I, you know, I was just talking about a, not really unrelated point, but I was talking about this has been a lot of chess plays happening until this point uh, i, I want to give you some theories that i would love for you to react to and then i want to give you the floor to kind of like break it down as you see fit so i had said last week really once i oh. seen two things i we seen the uh subpoena get fired off for daphne joy which is 50 cents baby mama and diddy um for uh, related to them at some miami hotels also, simultaneously, we see Diddy go to New York. We haven't seen Diddy in New York without him being on a press run in years. We also see that 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 house he had in Homely Hills in L.A. It's officially like the, the realtors are taking care of that. I said the well, I don't want to say the end is near, but essentially the end is near. I felt the decision from the grand jury was going to be very near. And I said within the month. Unfortunately, I was right five, six days afterwards. We're hearing this. Um, we're getting some details that he was arrested in a, 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 the lobby of a, you know, uh, an expensive high rise, New York high rise. And by the way, you know, Chad, I'll show you guys this uh, afterwards. But the U.S. attorney is saying that the indictment they plan to unseal in the morning. Myron, what are your thoughts about all this? Um, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, man. Uh, so what, what do you want to go into in particular as far as, uh, for, as far as this case? Cause this is all, you know, a very complex situation with, okay. with overall investigation. What Perfect. do you want to go into particularly? Perfect. So, you know, I keep hearing this a lot that people are like, why didn't he run? Why didn't blah, blah, blah. What, like in a situation where like just you know go back to your your your, your, your you know your HSI days you know what i mean yeah. and if you guys are monitoring or had a active investigation slash grand jury proceeding on a high profile target how would that have taken place and then how would potentially an arrest look like Okay, sure. So I think the number one thing here to keep note of is um, Diddy was cooperating with the authorities, right? Like his attorneys were pretty much talking to the United States Attorney's Office the whole time, um, like, you know, trying to, hey, look, he's going to be traveling here. He's going to do this, etc. And I think the reason why he did that was he understood that uh, indictment is imminent. He's going to get arrested at some point. And he looks at it like, look, the charges are coming down. We probably know what they're going to do. And we can talk about that next. So he's looking at it like, I need to be out on bond to fight this case, right? Mm, yeah. I don't want to be, at, you know, in jail uh, during the proceedings. So he wants to be out on bond. So I think what he, the way his team angled it was they're going to be cooperative. Anytime you travel, they let them know, etc. Hey, we're intending to do this. We're intending to do that. Hey, a matter of fact, I'm going to be in New York so I can be close to you guys because it's, it's HSI New York that did this in the Southern District of yep. New York, which is one of the most aggressive prosecutorial offices in the country. Hey, hey by, by the way, are are they? You know, I don't know how they um score efficiency, but like it feels like that they almost get the most amount of cases or high profile cases, especially yeah, some of the most high profile cases. They were responsible for indicting the mafia in the 1980s, mm. right? Uh, with Paul Castellano and these guys back in the day, John Gotti. They went after them. Rudy Giuliani famously went after them. Um, they did the six nine case. They did the Casanova case. A lot of the big hip hop cases out of New York get indicted out of Southern District of New York. Um, so it's, it's a big, it's a big district and they're one of the most aggressive at USA's offices, one of the most prestigious. So he's like, look, I know the indictments are coming down. I'm going to go ahead and cooperate and I'm going to put myself in New York. Uh, so if you guys have access to me, any questions, etc. and obviously they indicted him and he was right there. So I think the play from his legal team was, Hey, 
We're going to make a case that when indictments do come down, when we go to your initial appearance and we try to get bond, they're going to give you an on bond because you've already shown that you're not a flight risk. The two biggest things that they look for whenever you're um, doing your bond hearing are, are you a danger to the community and are you a flight risk? Obviously, by him saying, yo, I'm cooperating and I'm doing whatever, um, he's going to probably surrender his passport. He's not going to be a flight risk. And then as far as like a danger to community, you know, he can make the argument, I'm not a danger to the community, etc. So more than likely, I predict he's probably going to get bond, which is why he's been so cooperative in the first place. And him and his attorney, legal team have probably been coordinating with the United States Attorney's Office. Okay. All right. So, okay. Still a million things to unpack. First of all, <laughs> we've seen um, we've seen even foreign criminals. El Chapo. We, we, we've yeah. seen those people being taken into custody. Obviously, that the the level of the risk of, you know, flight risk clearly changes when you're an international, you know, uh, um, suspect versus one like Diddy, who, as you said, is cooperating. But yeah, if you're a foreign national, no status in the United States, it's an automatic detention okay. every single time. Automatic detention. You don't get uh, like you would need. The only way that you wouldn't get bo you would get bond as a foreign national with no status in the United States is. Uh, the, and the HSI agent would need to parole you, which wouldn't make sense. They would never do that. So, because that would mean that you're probably cooperating. But if you're in jail at some point, like it just wouldn't happen nine out of ten times. So, if you're an illegal alien with no status, automatic detention. Okay. Remember, we're we're, we're talking about Diddy. Yeah, he's a U.S. citizen. So. Okay. And but but, but very high profile guy. What, what, yeah. What does a bond hearing um, even looks like? Or like, what's a bond package or a bail package that that? And I know we're jumping the gun a little bit because we, we got to get into the indictment and, and what, what we probably think it is. Oh, but right into it. So this is what's going to happen. You got arrested by HSI in New York. Which, uh, for those that are wondering, I used to be an HSI agent out of uh, Laredo, Texas. You know, I've been to the Miami to the New York field office uh, a couple of times. You know, I'm very familiar with that office. They're you know obviously a big office. They do a lot of big cases. They did. Uh, they were intimately involved in the R. Kelly case. They actually were the ones that did the six nine case. So HSI New York is definitely a, a powerhouse, and so is that U.S. Attorney's Office. So I'm not surprised they aggressively pursued this. But this is what's going to happen. He got he got indicted. He got arrested, right? Mm -hmm. They probably got the true bill today, uh, this afternoon sometime. They went to go pick him up at the hotel. What's going to happen is he's going to have his initial appearance in front of a magistrate judge tomorrow, probably in Manhattan. Uh, when he's there... They're going to unseal the indictment and they're going to hit him with the charges. I predict it's probably going to be sex trafficking and racketeering because, uh, and I could talk about why it's going to be racketeering here in a, in a second, but uh, he's going to go to his initial appearance in front of a magistrate judge. That magistrate judge is going to assign him to a district judge because he's been indicted. So now his case is going to go to a district judge for, for his initial appearance because it's, a, you know, mandatory by law that you go see a judge within you know 24 to 72 hours of you being arrested. So he's going to get the charges read to him uh, that are on the indictment. Um, he's not going to actually in enter a plea. It's an initial appearance only. They're going to tell him he has the right to remain silent, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, they're going to ask, Hey, what does the government want to do as far as like his bond, which I'm assuming him and his legal team are probably posturing to try to get him released on a bond, uh, tomorrow is what I'm assuming, which is why he's been so cooperative and flew, flew up to New York and kind of made himself available to the feds. Cause he knew that this indictment was imminent. Okay. Do you believe that that magistrate judge? Um, which which you know is going to be tasked with the initial appearance. Do you think that you know again we're talking high profile case? It's a lot of man hours, a lot of money. Do you yeah. think that they are prepared to deal with a potential bond application or a bond? You know, almost initial appearance to listening to bond tomorrow, or is something that they will probably put off to another date. I think they'll probably kind of figure it out tomorrow. Um, I think the whole purpose of him cooperating with the government the way he has was for this very moment so that he can get bond. And if he doesn't get it on this one, there'll probably be a bond hearing shortly thereafter, maybe a, a couple days after, where they just will strictly have a bond hearing because he's not going to be entitled to what's called a preliminary hearing to establish probable cause because he's been indicted by a grand jury. So the next step is going to be the arraignment, which is where he's actually going to formally enter his plea. Um, and obviously there's going to be a potential bond hearing if they need it. But I think more than likely he's either a going to get the bond tomorrow or B there'll be a bond hearing specifically for that, where, you know, his attorneys are going to argue on his behalf and say that he's not a fly risk or a danger to the community, which are the two main prerequisites to, you know, get yourself bond. He'll probably surrender his passport if he hasn't already. And, uh, and yeah, but I predict he's probably going to get out on bond, which is why he's been so cooperative with them in the first place. Okay. All right, so let's deal with some, you know, minute details. And I know you've been there where you're the main case agent and you've gotten a case. 
you've presented it, and I don't know, it maybe worked it up, maybe your chain of command, but eventually they got approved to go to the U.S. Attorney's Office. They say, yes, we're going to go with this. Somehow there, there is an, either an indictment or it's just written up in a complaint, and you now have to serve the arrest warrant. What do you think? So this one came down via TMZ today. Uh, they said they plan to arrest him t yet tomorrow, but something came up. We don't know what they haven't said. They had to do it today. In your experience, what was this like? Again, you know, obviously you're saying that you believe that there was a presentment um, today that the true bill um, of indictment came through. Uh, that, so they're aware of it. What do you think could have changed the circumstances? You you just, you know, again, we're, we're spitballing. We don't know everything, but, you know, you're probably the best person we could, we could yeah, ask. So I can explain that. So, um, so, so I guess I could talk about the case agent perspective, then we'll go into the indictment. So for the audience that's wondering, because they might not be understand some of these terms. So, guys, the case agent is the agent or the special agent in this case that's going to be responsible. That's running that investigation. Right. He's running the case. He's coordinating directly with the U.S. attorney. Right. The AUSA, you know, assistant United States attorney that's doing the case. And they're kind of working together. Now, the feds work a lot differently than the state. And what I mean by this is. The special agent and the prosecutor are on the phone like almost every day. They become like best friends because you don't have the same level of authority, you know, counter to, you know, uh, what people think, right? Common to, uh, to belief, what people think is people think, oh, yeah, feds have all this power, et cetera. The reality is the feds don't have that much power. We don't have the same authority to do probable cause arrests like state and locals do. State and local finds you on the car, right? And you're drive drinking, uh, drinking and driving, you had a DUI or whatever, they can just go ahead and make that probable cause arrest right there. Or they catch you with drugs. They can make that arrest there. Feds don't work that way. Mm. They need to call a prosecutor, a federal prosecutor, and say, look, I got XYZ. I want to go ahead and prosecute this case, which rarely happens with probable cause arrest. Most cases at the federal level are done by indictment, as you guys are seeing here. And I can explain that whole process if you want me to. But regardless, wait, wait, in this on, case on, was on. indicted. So that means no, that you, this agent went in. Wait, hold, with on, the hold on, hold on, hold on. You're, you're giving some new information I didn't know. So, so... Okay. On a, yeah, this is extensive. So you know, stop me wherever you need to. Yeah. Okay. So so you just explained what most people because again, when we hear the feds, it's like the boogeyman, right? So like that's just super different, right? So for example, yeah, if a local police pulls you over this and third, and they have probable cause, they could just arrest you and hit you with the charges when they get to the station, whatever the case is, right? Yep. But you're 100%. saying that the feds don't move like that. No, they don't. And and the reason why, yeah. right? So I'll give you guys a perfect example. When I was on the Southwest border, right? Mm -hmm. Someone comes in, tries to smuggle drugs through the port, <laughs> Customs and Border Protection arrests them, right? Detain them because they got the drugs right then and there. They call HSI. I show up. I seize the drugs. I take the individual. I call the prosecutor. I say, look, we got him here with 10 kilos of coke at the bridge. Um, you know, he's confessed, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to write up a criminal complaint. Are you guys going to accept prosecution? Yeah, we got you. Boom. Okay. So I, I take him, drop him off at the jail, go back to the office, write up my criminal complaint, send it to the AUSA. He sends it to the judge. Next morning, I'm there, swear to it, sign it, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, we're, we, that was a probable cause arrest in that case. That doesn't happen often at the federal level. Oh. Most of the time, you're doing a long term investigation, you're working hand in hand with the prosecutor, which is why they're close, like I explained before, and you're building up a case that might take months, if not years. To build up and on top of that you had to go to the AUSA prior and say look I'm um, doing this investigation this is the target this is the organization blah 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 you got to sell it because AUSAs <coughs> have um, a lot of discretion which cases they take and which cases they don't take they might say hey that's not good enough for us go ahead and take it to the state we're not going to go ahead and take that wow. so probable cause arrests aren't as common at the federal level you typically have to go through an AUSA and get indicted after a long-term investigation that's why the feds don't have the same arrest authority as a state and locals do state and locals can arrest you all day if they see you with drugs or they see that you're drunk or disorderly conduct whatever the fuck it may be they have a lot more power probable cause arrest because district attorney's offices are a lot more flexible than united states attorney's offices does that make sense no no it, it makes absolute sense and by the way you're giving us information that we would have not known because i think a lot of times when we think of law enforcement we think you know obviously we, we hear about 97% conviction rate when it comes to the feds, but we think pretty much law enforcement is law enforcement. We're, we're just thinking that's the um, prosecutor's office. Okay, cool. I see why. That's precisely why they win so many cases because the AUSAs have such discretion. They don't take cases unless, like, put it this way AUSA is not going to indict you 99% of the time unless they don't think they're, unless they're not sure they're going to win at trial. 
Like when I was used to come in with my grand jury packet to indict somebody, yeah. mm -hmm. it wasn't just just for indictment or probable cause. The AUSA was like, I need enough where if we went to trial tomorrow, we would win. So the feds don't mess around with that because they have such discretion. That's why they have such high um, conviction rates is because when they indict you, they're already ready for trial, ready to go. So, so did he's finished? Yeah, dude, it's it's well, it's a wrap. Well, oh, okay, okay. So, so so let's, you know, again, we don't know for sure, but again, th this is the best source anyone could have it right now. And by the way, thank you, Myron. And by the way, fresh. What up, my nigga? Um, what up, bro? Yeah, this is my office. Like, um, you know, I worked out of the Miami field office, but the New York office, I'm very familiar with how they work. You know, this is my agency, so I know exactly how they work. Work. This was, you know, a human trafficking 15 case. So. You know, OK, uh, so here's uh, yeah. the question I have. So I want you to kind of walk me through. OK, you, you were a case agent, right? And. Um, at what point do you pass it over to the U.S. attorney's office? And so how much how much of the work here is there like an agent or maybe a couple of agents doing versus, OK, this is when we definitely know. This is in the U.S. attorney's hands, and they're making these plays. So you break it down from at least externally what sure. we've seen. So this is how I think. This is what I, you know, speculate the investigation started to some degree. When Cassie first came out and said that she was being abused by him, etc., mm -hmm. right? And they might have got tips and everything else like this from before, right, from the tip line or whatever. What I think more than likely happened was they started talking to a couple of people, going out, doing a couple knock and talks. Hey, this seems a little weird. You know, these women keep coming forward and complaining about, you know, you know, nefarious sexual activity with Diddy from dating back from the 90s, whatever. This is a little weird. And at that point, you know, especially if you're dealing with someone high profile, after the second or third or fourth interview where you might have a good witness or two, you're going to the United States Attorney's Office early on, right? And you're saying, look, this is the target. This is who he is. This is what we think we can build, etc. We talk to these people, whatever. And I think in a case like this, they more than likely had the U.S. Attorney's Office ear early on and you know i've always said this the feds in the united states attorney's office right they like clout they like the ability to prosecute high profile individuals it's going to hit the news it's going to be big a big w for them a big press release so i'm assuming once they figured out who the guy was right right diddy they probably were working with the united states attorney's office fairly early on this is what i predict mm, okay given the nature of who the individual was and also keep in mind there was a successful prosecution with r kelly prior to this so okay. The, then and some of if i'm not mistaken some of the AUSAs that were on that case were also involved in this r kelly case all right so uh, are, are involved in this diddy case that were involved in the r kelly case sorry yeah so so let me ask you this question right and and, and you mentioned your prediction and, and i guess you could you, you could expound on your prediction for charges and i would love to hear you explain that before but but i but in following up to that i also want you to you know answer the question of okay if if because you mentioned you know racketeering and yeah many, and usually when people are in a racket it's it's more than one it's just not a singular individual and maybe I'm wrong but do you believe that this indictment solely falls on Sean Diddy Combs or maybe there are three four five six a dozen other people maybe not charged with everything but but with kind of ancillary people who the prosecutor is going to try to dance along maybe in a trial to say, hey, these were the people that were doing his bidding, but he was making a call. What, what do you think? Yeah, so so the reason why they're going to have to use the racketeering statute, right, um, is because a lot of these crimes happened uh, a long time ago, right? Like some of these crimes are beyond the statute of limitations. So in order for the prosecutors to kind of bring in some of those allegations that happened in the 90s or maybe even the 80s or early 2000s or whatever, they're going to need to go ahead and prove that he was committing these crimes for a period of time, right? Racketeering activity, right? And the, the criminal organization is ongoing or the criminal enterprise is ongoing. So that is why they're going to have to do this under the auspice of RICO so that they can go ahead and say, look, we're going to bring in all these other crimes right, that were done decades ago because he's been doing it for a while. So um, sex trafficking is considered a crime that falls under the RICO Act, right? It, there's, you it, know, there's it, it, drug trafficking, there's uh, violence, witness intimidation, there's, um, you know, uh, extortion, you know, all these different types of crimes that they typically had there historically to go after organized crime like the mafia, whatever. Um, as long as they can prove that he's still committing these crimes to some degree, 
they can bring in all those um, allegations from prior, but they need to do it under the RICO statute to be able to bring them in so they get around this whole statute of limitations problem. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I spoke about that before, too. It, 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 could you, um, so, so sex trafficking, and I've heard a few, you know, like, you know, us YouTubers on here, you know, obviously, uh, the 99.9, and you're obviously the 0.1% that has worked in law enforcement. Like, yeah. we're, we're either like ghetto, law ghetto lawyers, or we're going off like what we either know from either our experience dealing with the criminal justice system, or just kind of like looking at these things a lot. Uh, could you explain sex trafficking? Because I've heard, like, for example, like Wack 100 um, said, he said, yo, well, if you fly a girl out and you fuck her, and if she alleges that there is an abuse there, well, the person crossed state lines, this and third, it's sex trafficking. And I'm like, damn, that's kind of like a very loose and broad, you know, uh, uh, um, interpretation of what sex trafficking could be. What is sex trafficking? Um, and, and, and where would a, you know, a federal uh, authority start to look at it in? So I'm going to just kind of give the more practical agent side of it, right? So okay. the thing with sex trafficking, and this is very contrary to what people think, it's not as common as people think it is, right? What people always conflate sex trafficking with is human smuggling. Bringing in illegal aliens into the United States for some, uh, for some or a fee, those individuals are brought into the United States, their you know, families are being extorted, etc. That's human smuggling. Now, does it lead to human trafficking later on when they get into the United States and they're forced to work jobs or whatever it may be? Of course. But people often conflate human smuggling with human trafficking, which are two completely different crimes. One is you know, AUSC 1324. The other one is a far more serious crime at the, that's 18 USC, right? Which is the criminal code versus the immigration code. So that's number one. Number two, as far as sex trafficking goes, um, it's actually fairly hard to prove. A lot of the times when people think that they got a sex trafficking case, and I know this because I've been on so many of these different raids, is what ends up happening is you bust the prostitution ring, right? You thought, oh, yeah, we got, we had these uh, girls are being trafficked, whatever. You talk to them and they all love their pimp. They don't want to cooperate. They don't want to say that they were being held or whatever. You know, some of them are lying to protect them. Some of them were trafficked or whatever. But the point is, is that it's very difficult to get witnesses because sometimes they don't want to necessarily cooperate. So what ends up happening is you just end up getting everyone arrested for solicitation charges, right? Ends up being just mm. a prostitution ring bust. Now, the way to get around that, though, right, which is how the feds come in a lot of the times is... If the girls are under 18, it's an automatic human trafficking charge. Wow. Automatic. Mm. Why so automatic? that's where they're going to get them. Is some of these girls, from what I understand, were under 18 at the time when Diddy was messing with them and bringing them around in different states. Okay. That, uh, I think they're going to get them. I mean, I'll have to look at the indictment to see, but this is my prediction. Okay. L l let me interject and, and add. Um, so, so on one of the particular civil cases that he has is that there was a young woman who was 17 that was supposedly you know uh she met someone that worked for his label that person said hey i think diddy would like you they they called diddy diddy spoke to the girl spoke to the person and then within a matter of hours the girl got on a private jet to fly to diddy and allegedly Damn. was around him by the way, this girl, I, I, I'll, I'll post it here. I'll send you a link if you want to show it on, you know, your stream. Yeah, um, please, please. Or you, you could even Google 17-year-old Diddy. Uh, there's multiple, uh, there's multiple like, ar uh, articles about it. Her face is blurred out. She was seen sitting on his lap, okay? Uh, there's a New York Post. I, I'll post it in the chat here. I don't, I don't know if. So whoever, okay, yeah, because uh, Bill's on the computer, so he okay, can do it. All right, so, so, so Bill, you, you could just click, in, just click from the chat. Um, is is the chat between me and uh, Myron, and it's a New York posting. It says Sean Diddy Combs accused of drugging and gang R wording a 17 year old in a new suit. Uh, there's photos of this girl sitting on his lap. Obviously, she's not shown for obvious reasons. She was 17 at the time. Um, yeah. Her lawsuit against him says she was gang R worded, but mm -hmm. what's also very important is she was 17. Here's yep. e e here's the important part. I think she was in, I believe, uh, let me make sure, Detroit, I believe, and then he was either in New York and let me just make sure, chat. I'm sorry. Yes, the woman says she met Pierre, who was an executive at Bad Boys Entertainment. They so so she met one of his workers in Detroit. 
at a lounge. And mm -hmm. then essentially he called Sean Diddy Combs on the phone and convinced mm -hmm. the team to fly to New York City. Uh, before leaving the lounge, they said the, 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 the worker took her to the bathroom where he smoked crack with her and apparently had her have sex with him first. Then yeah. he put her in a private jet from Pontiac, Michigan. She landed in Teterboro. New Jersey, which this is where this is where Jay Z and everybody else, everybody who got a private jet who goes to New York lands in Jersey at Teterboro. That's fact. Um, okay. And yeah, they drove to a studio, and the pitch she has pictures to prove she's with him. Would yeah, that be considered so as sex trafficking? Yeah, that's that's a cut and dry human trafficking right there at the federal level because um, she's not eighteen. He trapped. He moved her in between states that affects interstate commerce. So. That's that's where they're gonna get them, and and you know, and I know some of the audience here might be shocked by me saying that human trafficking isn't as prevalent as people think, but it really isn't. Um, you know, it's really the human smuggling that is is the extremely common thing that people tend to conflate because they're com two completely different crimes. But the big way, and I know this from you know being on human trafficking task forces and working with these guys closely, a lot of the times when they do these busts, what ends up happening is. It's prostitution ring, and they don't want to cooperate against the pimp. They're not really being abused. They're doing it willingly, and they're of age. However, if they catch a girl there that's underage, then it morphs into human trafficking automatically because that woman can't consent. I have a question. That's how they get the nexus. If the girl lied about her age, does that matter? Doesn't matter. Mm. Mm. Doesn't matter. Th th so if she's 17 and she was being, uh, and there was a pimp and she was being pros prostituted, it's automatic human trafficking charge. And the feds will take that almost always. And the two biggest agencies that investigate human trafficking are Homeland Security Investigation, HSI, and the FBI. Okay. Also, what about this? Um, in different states, there's different ages of consent. Yeah. So on a state level, I believe, and we could Google it for New York. New York age of consent. Might be 17. That is 17. Now, that's statewide. Obviously, the, the national age of consent federally is 18. Could Diddy have an argument to say, well, she came here willingly, and the age of consent in New York is 17. Hmm. Yeah, I make her. I, I I wouldn't be surprised if his legal team doesn't try it. Um, you know, uh, but they're they're gonna say, hey, federally it's it's eighteen, so we'll see we'll see what happens. Um, and I think that's where he's gonna have to pay his defense team the big bucks to make that argument in court for him. Hmm. Wow. 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 Okay. So okay. So all right, we get sex trafficking. So so. I I think everybody who's spoken about this and I've spoken to you, I've spoken to Bradford Cohen. Yo, I got to get you with Bradford Cohen. Like, I'm telling you, like, he's 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 an invaluable mind that I've everything he's predicted when it comes to these proceedings have always been correct. And I think you and him, you guys are like, it would be like a power couple. Pause. Anyway. Yeah, sure. Okay. But wait, she came from Michigan, you said, right? Yes. She came from Detroit, Michigan. Consent. A 16 in Michigan? Okay. All right. I was just looking to see what the age of consent is in Michigan. But sorry, what was the next thing you wanted to okay. hit? Okay. So, so I guess we're looking at the litany of charges he could face. It, it appears that sex trafficking is going to be on the bill, right? Um, there's been rumors about, well, the 1999 shooting, the club shooting, that supposedly, you know, the woman who was shot in the, in the face and who believes that Diddy was the one who pulled the trigger, but New York um, State, uh, did not charge Diddy with that crime. Um, mm -hmm. Instead, they blame it on Shine. That yep. particular situation, we're hearing about the Tupac situation. Uh, we're hearing about maybe other and and and, and I had I had said this earlier, but I want to get your take on it. Remember the first person when they did the raid that was arrested. The only person that was you know arrested, not detained, was supposedly the drug mule. Do you oh, see yeah. maybe, oh, and, and we hear a lot of drugs. Do, do we see maybe some drug charges kind of mixed into it? It kind of gives it some color. You know, no, unfortunately, I'm not trying to like, you know, just content this out, but just like it it, it, it kind of makes it seem like, hey, it's not only sex trafficking. This is a drug-fueled environment. 
and then maybe you could add some violence in with you know either to pad up the racketeering right so when when you're when you're hitting people with rico right like mm -hmm. you have certain crimes in there that you want to show to establish that it's a criminal enterprise and they're committing crimes in furtherance of the organization right so you know like i said there's a couple different crimes that fall under the racketeering right vehicle theft extortion murder kidnapping uh drug trafficking etc so what i predict is right we don't know the indictment yet we'll see it tomorrow probably when it's unsealed when he goes in front of the judge uh they might put that in there to kind of pad that this is a component to that to the um to the um criminal organization you know because some of these women that were that are victims you know complained and said oh yeah i was under the influence of drugs they were readily available to me etc so they can use that to kind of substantiate and prop up this rico charge because the reason why um, they're using the RICO is because the RICO allows them to bring in all these other cases um, in that might have been kind of fallen by the wayside due to statute limitations. RICO allows them to bring it back in. Mm. It's kind of like the glue that holds everything together, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, do you do you think that there will be any specific charges of, you know, sexual assault? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, for sure. Because um, the thing is, is that they've been they've had this grand jury convened for a very long time. Um, I remember reading about this originally, like almost two to three months ago, that they started doing these grand jury things. So that tells me the fact that they're indicting him. Is now, that all usual? Is that all usual? Like, like, again, we have no idea about federal grand juries. It feels like they've they've presented this case for two months. And OK, let me explain how grand jury works to the federal level. Ahead. Give me one second. Hold on. So, because a lot of people, because, okay, so the grand jury is nothing more than a group of your peers that sit in a room and deliberate on cases based on probable cause, right? So, not to be confused with a, a trial jury, right, where it's like, you know, 12, 6 or 12, whatever that may be, right, uh, 12 people. Um, so, a grand jury, right? The AUSA convene, then they probably, they typically serve for, you know, three months, six months, whatever it may be. And they'll sit there and the grand jury typically convenes once a week, depending on how busy the, um, the, the, um, the United States attorney's office is, how often they're indicting cases, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is the AUSA comes in with their case agent and the AUSA asks the, the case agent questions, right? And the case agent presents evidence to the case. Now, keep in mind, I want to make this very clear. It's just to establish probable cause, guys. Probable cause is not that high of a threshold, right? But like I said before, when you're indicting, the AUSA pretty much is ready to go to trial. So it's probable cause just to get the indictment, but obviously the AUSA is looking long-term to win a trial. So you go in there, and I've testified literally hundreds of times. You go in there, they sit you down, they swear you in, and they ask you questions, right? The AUSA asks you questions on the case, you explain the case, then they open it up for a Q&A for the grand jury to ask you questions. They, you answer any questions in there about the case, anything that wasn't clear. You walk out the grand jury room, you and the AUSA, you give them some time to deliberate, you know, depending on how complex the case is, that will dictate how long it takes them to deliberate. And then you get something called a true bill of indictment after the fact. That true bill of indictment is filed with the clerk, and then you go ahead and you get an arrest warrant from the judge. And that's to answer your question that you mentioned before, hey, why did they pick them up tonight versus tomorrow? What I'm assuming is... Since they had the grand jury convening, right, and uh, they knew that he was going to be indicted today, I guarantee they had probably agents watching him the whole time, and they saw he was at the hotel lobby. They're like, bro, we got we got eyes on him. It's safe to do it. He, We technically have an arrest warrant for him now, and in the arrest warrant, if you look at any federal arrest warrant, it says at the bottom, you are hereby commanded to arrest XYZ, mm -hmm. right? So if you got him in plain sight and it's easy, it's it's safe to affect the arrest, you kind of have to arrest him. Because you've been commanded by a magistrate judge now that you have that um, that arrest warrant or a district judge, depending on whatever it is. But regardless, you got a, a, an arrest warrant from the judge. So they probably had eyes on him the whole time. They saw he was in a hotel lobby. Arrest warrant was signed by the judge. They just picked him up right then and there. That's why I predict why it, they picked him up this evening. So, so, so you're, you're not you're not you're not um, thinking that maybe, you know, even though he seems like he has to be co cooperative, you don't, you don't think that maybe. I don't know. He was like, oh, I got to go back to Miami. And maybe like he hit like his plane guy like, hey, let's go to my let's go back to Miami because I don't know if he would know when the 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 indictment would be coming down. And they're like, no, 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 fuck that. We're not going to wait till he gets on another plane. 
Um, that, could been, that could have been a reason too. I, I mean, I'm I'm thinking, you know, typically the most simple answer tends to be the answer. What I'm mm-hmm. predicting is they probably have been having him. They've had him under surveillance for a few days now, especially knowing that the grand jury convened and it was going to indict him today, kind of to see if he was going to run or see what would happen. And at this point, with the way phone his attorney was, or no? what was that? Do you think that maybe they have his phone tap? Like, what's the surveillance like at this point? Like, like uh, I, I use six mm-hmm. nine as a as an example. Basically, like. 6ix9ine said, like, I remember him explained to me in depth. He said, yo, I knew what it was. Every time I went outside, there was always a car that I drove right by. It was always unmarked. There was always, like, this one car up there. Like, it, it was basically, he said he kind of knew, but not really knew that he was being definitely heavily surveilled. surveilled. And also, you know, essentially, his phones were also being tapped as well. Do, do you think they tap his phone just for this purpose or no? no? No, I'm pretty certain that they did. Because here's the thing. So another common misconception. People think that tapping a phone is very easy. Getting a federal Title Three, which is what it means to get live communication, guys, is extremely fucking difficult. And I can mm. tell you guys, it's because I've written an affidavit and gotten a Title Three before. It's very fucking hard to get one. Because here's the thing. When you write search warrants, right, a phone tap is the most intrusive almost one of the most intrusive law enforcement techniques that you can use. So typically the more intrusive the search, the more probable cause you need to th- conduct that search. And I've said this before, I'll say it again. You need more probable cause to listen to someone's phone than to fucking arrest them. And the reason why is because really? you're not only infringing on that individual's, you know, privacy, right? Or violating the fourth amendment to a degree, but you're doing it legally. You're also listening into the private conversations of other individuals that may or may not be subjects of investigation. So when you're listening to their phone, um, it's one of the highest standards of of, uh, of getting a search warrant because you're listening in and it has to go through a bunch of different people. A district judge has to sign it. It needs to go through something called OEO at the U- U.S. Department of Justice. It's very difficult to get a wiretap. So what I predict is since this crime was a crime of things that occurred years ago, it wouldn't make sense. And I actually doubt that they would have the probable cause required to get a phone line tap to actually listen to stuff because I don't know if you want me to go into this, but to get an actual title three, you need dirty phone calls. You need informants. You need a pen register, which this is all, you know, if you really want me to go into this, how a phone tap works, I can, but, uh, cause I've done it, but I, I I'm 99% sure that they didn't do any title three intercepts on this investigation. Cause this is a more historical investigation where you're interviewing witnesses of crimes that occurred in the past, which is why they're using the racketeering statute because they're trying to bring in these crimes uh, to kind of save them from statute limitations problems. Wow. No, no, I'm, hey, hey, uh, hey, again, I'm, I'm so thankful to have you on here. It's like invaluable information. I will say way- this. What they could have been doing, though, instead of a phone tap, right? Because I, I want to be very clear here. There's different ways to, to um, exploit telephones from a law enforcement perspective, right? There's different thresholds. There's something called a ping warrant, right? Which I've done this a million times when I would follow drug traffickers around where you're able to track the phone, right? And get an update, you know, it's up to you how you want to do it, but you can get it 30 minutes, hour, et cetera. And you basically know where the guy is going, right? Now, with that said, they would have to prove that the telephone and his travel was involved in some type of criminal activity. So for drug traffickers, it's easy because you could be like, look, this guy's going to be having a pattern of uh, behavior where he's going to be picking up drugs from individuals and meeting a stash house, et cetera. We need to know where he's going, right? Or you can use this to do, put a tracker on a vehicle too, um, where you, you're you like, hey, he's involved in this type of crime. I need to know where he's going, et cetera. So they could do what's called a ping warrant on him to know where he's going at all times. That might not be needed though, because obviously his his defense team was cooperating with him. Uh, so you know, that could be a, a play as well, but I, I kind of doubt it in this situation since he was cooperating. Then you have something called a pen register. And a pen register, a.k.a. a trap and trace, is where you... So they basically will get every single person calling you, right, and every single phone call that you make. Now, it doesn't show the contents of the conversation of or what's being said, but it just shows frequency. So I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm watching a drug trafficker and I know that he's involved in dealing cocaine or methamphetamine, whatever, right? And I see that he calls this one certain phone number the most. I'm going to do a subpoena on that phone number, identify who that individual is, and I find out, oh, this guy has a criminal history for trafficking drugs, boom. And I start to identify the organization, right? And then that's how you kind of build it out. 
That's another way to exploit the telephones. I doubt that they're doing that, though, because this isn't a drug trafficking investigation. He's not actively involved in the crimes anymore. If anything, he's probably, you know, trying to avoid it. So I doubt that they did a pen register, too. I think in this case, they just had good old fashioned, you know, eye surveillance. Um, his legal team was cooperating. And then this is a historical case anyway. So this is strictly based on witness testimony. It's going to be a witness testimony heavy investigation. OK, now, um, again, you know, and I feel like I'm almost dick riding pause, uh, but you're the perfect person to have on at this moment. But I do have to ask this question because, you know, I, I, you know, again, I keep saying Bradford Cohen. He's also said he's also like kind of analyzed this point, but I want to hear your an analysis of it. Yeah. So it made the news. It made TMZ that they one of the last things. And, and you tell me where you think this came from. Do you think this came from the the U.S. Attorney's Office or the grand jury. But there was subpoenas sent out to Miami hotels that had to do with the whereabouts and also activity of not only Diddy, but 50 Cent's baby mama, Daphne Joy. Does that, make, like, number one, I want you to analyze that, but then second of all, does that make it almost seem like Daphne Joy might be either potentially a target or maybe she's someone that was cooperating that they're just validating what the fuck she's told them because that's okay yeah. um cool the, the, so i can answer that and then the other thing i want to say too because some people are saying they always tap the phones i also want to be clear here that a title three wire intercept to listen to phones through the regular court system is much different than a fisa wiretap where you're basically doing on national security grounds if you're doing a fisa phone wire a phone tap Obviously, the threshold is not as high as a regular Title III because you have national security implications, so you're able to get it much easier. So if you're a spy or trying to do anything against the United States that affects national security, they're going to be able to wiretap your phone way easier. Now, to answer your question as far as subpoenas go, so here's the thing. So every agency operates differently here, but when it comes to HSI, HSI has something called admin subpoena power. And what that means is you can go into a business or you can go ahead and serve a phone company or whatever it may be, and you can say, look, I need information on X, Y, Z, and you serve them a subpoena on, you know, maybe it's an immigration case, a customs case, a drug case, whatever it may be. They have different statutes that they can use to gain information via subpoena. Then you also have something called a grand jury subpoena. I'll give you the, an example of what the two mean, right? So let's say I have a target of investigation and they have um, a Google account, right? Okay. And I want to figure out, who is the subscriber to that Google account? I send an administrative subpoena to Google to tell me who the user is on that account. Google will furnish me the information because I gave them a legal document. However, after 30, 60, 90 days, they will notify the subscriber, look, the feds asked us about your account. And they, they, they can go ahead and disclose that to their customer, right? Banks do this. Um, uh, phone companies will do this, et cetera, right? Now, if I hand them a grand jury subpoena, now they can't say shit, right? So think of it as a grand jury subpoena as a more powerful way to, got, to get information, right? It's a little bit more of a pain in the ass to get one, yeah. but it, you typically want to use grand jury subpoenas, especially for banks. Because if you give a bank a, uh, an admin subpoena, some of them might not honor it, or they'll say, well, we're going to notify the, our, our um, account holder like within a month or whatever. Obviously, you don't want them to, to find out that they're the subject of investigation, so you want to give them a... Um, and grand jury subpoena. Admin subpoenas are typically reserved for phone companies. Phone companies typically will, you know, they won't tell the subscriber that, you know, they'll just give you the phone number, who it belongs to, address, that type of shit, basic stuff. So with all that said, the fact that we know that there were subpoenas sent to these hotels mm -hmm. leads me to believe that they probably served them with administrative subpoenas, right? Um, which is, you know, they work. But you deal with the issues where it's not necessarily kept to the same level of secrecy as a grand jury subpoena. Because if you go ahead and you talk about the grand jury subpoena being served on you, well, now you can go to jail for that. Really? Does that make sense? No, 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 no. no. I, I compl no, I hear you. I said I had no idea you could potentially, if you, you know, um, bring that to light, you could be facing arrest. Uh, wow. Okay. Jury subpoena, yes. For admin, no. And only some agencies have admin subpoena power. I know DEA has it, HSI has it, FBI has it. I don't think ATF has it. They got to do everything through grand jury subpoena. And it depends on the agency and their and, and their administrative powers. But yeah, giving an admin subpoena will get you the information sometimes, but you have to deal with the risk. As a case agent, you got to make this decision. It's more of a pain in the ass to get a grand jury subpoena, but you'll be protected. 
However, you can do an admin subpoena and get it quickly and maybe potentially deal with them disclosing it to the subscriber. That's why I would only use admin subpoenas to, for phone stuff. I would never use it for anything else because a company like a hotel could potentially disclose that after a period of time. Wow. Okay, so are, are you in the belief, and I guess this is what I was trying to get to, so it was interesting that Daphne Joy's name was kind of tied to Diddy in, in, in that particular situation. Do you think that that means that she's either a potential witness or a potential person being investigated. It's and what's this? You said that's Diddy, like not Diddy. Um, it's Baby Mama, Fifty Cent, Baby Mama, Mama, right? Yeah, 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 she yeah. used to have a relationship with Diddy, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's correct. Uh, um, um, let me. Um, I want to read the exact. Uh, I want to read you the exact thing that we saw it at. Okay, okay, here we go. So this is, and by the way, this was. 831, which is obviously August 31st, 2024. I want to read you this and then you can interpret it. It says the federal authorities investigating Diddy to uh, to possibly get a criminal indictment against the music mogul are chugging along. Issuing a new grand jury subpoena related to a hotel in Florida. According to new, new legal docs obtained by TMZ, which you have you have you obviously have to know. They have their sources. They're the first. They did a grand jury subpoena. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the, TMZ is the first one to also figured out that Diddy's in custody. You know, they, they have a source in, in the Southern District. Trust me. Um, yeah, they got. <laughs> but federal prosecutors from the Southern District of New York got a subpoena requiring the fancy Miami hotel to cough up documents and other evidence related to Diddy. Here, here is where we get we get a little further. Diddy and his ex Daphne Joy, which is Fifty Cent's ex or Fifty Cent's baby mama are both named in the subpoena. The subpoena calls for the hotel to hand over reservation records in, involving Diddy and Daphne and other associates of Bad Boy uh, uh, Entertainment CEO. The subpoena names the period of January 1st, 2008 to present, asking for check-ins and check-out dates, room numbers, guest preferences, requests, billing information, and also room service. Federal prosecutors are also requesting emails and mail address and phone numbers along with forms of payments such as cash and credit cards, okay? They also ask for computer IP address, logins of individuals, uh, as well as copies of their identification and vehicle information. What's more, what's more uh, the feds inquired about surveillance footage at the hotel. The new subpoena was only issued a couple weeks ago. So it looked like you know they were you know they they found out about it afterwards clearly, <laughs> so it looks like the authorities are still hard at work on the Diddy probe. Yeah, so I can answer that. Um, that that's just like uh, you know that's what you would call like kind of a catch-all subpoena where you're not just going to subpoena every room that was under his name, but you're going to subpoena all the rooms that were under associates, girlfriends, um, employees, etc., so that you kind of have a broad scale and you know exactly. Um, every room that was rented and the probably the reason why they probably are doing that is because they probably heard testimony from one of the witnesses that said hey i was assaulted at this hotel during this time blah 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 so they're like all right cool for us to cover our bases so we can corroborate right because the thing is with, with witness testimony is you need to be able to corroborate it with actual real facts right so if one of the witnesses says hey i was sexually assaulted at this hotel on this you know honor about this day or month or year right what they're going to do is they're going to say, okay, cool. We need to be able to confirm that. So they're going to go back at those hotel records, show that Diddy did indeed have a room at this hotel at that specified period of time. And what that will do is that will beef up that witness's credibility in court. So your, your whole job, whenever you're a, an agent, right, and you're doing these cases is when you have a witness, you need to be able to independently corroborate everything they tell you through outside um, pieces of evidence that kind of stand on their own and hotel reservations is a great way to do that that's why i'm assuming they probably went ahead and did the grand jury subpoenas and they did it through a grand jury subpoena to make sure that it could come into court so um i think them putting her on the on the grand jury subpoenas is just to make sure that they get everything and they don't miss any rooms okay because if the nefarious activity did occur right if diddy has half a brain he's not going to put it under his name he's going to put it under the people that work for him or people that were with him that's wild Okay, so I'm going to ask you a very difficult question, which, which again, you, you may not be able to answer with facts at this moment because we're, 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 this is super preliminary. But, you know, 50 Cent accused Daphne Joy of being like a sex worker, you know, a whore. He says, says a little sex worker that like used to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's the thing. 
you know, again, going off what Bradford Cohen said, he 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 feels like maybe Cassie's team leaked that footage of Diddy beating her, that maybe potentially the feds couldn't look at, you know, her to be like, hey, well, okay, I know he was abusive to you, but look like you were the person who was hitting up all the escorts and flying the girls in. Diddy didn't do that. You did that. So maybe you're a co-conspirator. When you hear Daphne Joy's name being mentioned in a subpoena, is it possible that there could be maybe women, maybe managers, maybe assistants that get charged along with Diddy or at least were investigated to say, hey, this guy didn't do it by himself. You guys helped. You put the girls in your rooms. They weren't staying in Diddy's room. They stayed under your name, in rooms under your name. Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. And they're going to use that as a bargaining chip to ensure that all of them cooperate against Diddy. Because obviously, so Diddy is going to be looked at as like kind of the head of the organization and maybe his assistant is the number two. So they're going to do everything in their power to ensure that they get um, successful prosecution against him. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if they haven't already either A, brought her in or B, made her a target in the investigation to some degree where she's cooperating or they're letting her know that you can be charged too. So um, they're definitely going to have these people um, ready to go and testify in the, in the situation. Yo, at, can you imagine how 50 Cent feels about this? His baby mama is helping Diddy do his dirt, bro. That's some messed up shit, bro. That's well, your baby mama. That's, well, wow. Well, 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 Fresh, here's the thing, though. If, if, if I'm 50, we have to remember the timeline of things. So 50 goes on his rant after it's, it's being known that she's mentioned in a lawsuit. What does she do? She actually accuses 50 Cent of R word in her. Yep. Like, let's be clear. What 50 does? Okay. He files a lawsuit. At first, she didn't delete it. Then she deletes the post. Supposedly, uh, and I could Google it, I think 50 is not going forward with the lawsuit, particularly for defamation, which we all know, if anybody knows 50 Cent history, if you lie about him, he's going for that money. Mm. But here's the bigger plight that 50 might have to play, and I guess this is where I would ask Myron. Well, if she's either a witness or a potential part of this Diddy investigation slash indictment, I think what Diddy and most men would find the biggest win is not suing your baby mama who's broke without you paying her for defamation. The best thing would be showing to family court. Hey, maybe I deserve custody. Damn. My baby mama is a sex worker who's named in this indictment federally. <laughs> and no, no, is that a play? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you know, we yeah. all know that it's a lot harder for men to get custody of their children in family court, but um, showing that she's being uh, a subject of or indicted in a federal sex trafficking case is absolutely going <laughs> to swing it in the father's favor, especially someone like Diddy who has the resources to take care of the kid. So, yeah, well, I mean, 50, that's, that's 50, definitely 50, a play. 50 who has, 50, yeah. For 50. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, Clever. man, yo, yo, listen, so they're saying tomorrow, yo, it, it, I'm I'm wondering what this indict. So I also threw this into the air. I, I want you to react to it. So if you listen to some of the other lawsuits, they tried to say like even you know a few lawsuits. They were like, oh, the apple didn't fall too far from the tree, but they yeah. were trying to bring in Justin Combs into it. Is it possible? Yeah. And what do you think the odds are that any maybe additional indicted people end up being family? As opposed to, you know, I could see like maybe a worker like, hey, your job was to, you know, get the bitches here or what, whatever, whatever. But if his sons, even one of them, I don't think, you know, even though, you know, um, Christian Combs has is a civil case. But but if, if any of them gets caught up in the criminal case, how does that look? Um, I mean, it's possible if they if they assisted their father in any way. I mean, some of these charges seem to be kind of old, so they might have been children when it went down. Uh, but, you know, it's definitely possible that his kids can get wrapped up in the indictment as well. I, what I predict is more than likely um, Diddy and probably some of his closest associates were indicted in this one. You know, we'll have to see if any of them are taken into custody. 
Uh, but obviously he was the main guy that they were focused on getting, uh, you know, uh, arrested right away. So, you know, we'll only know until uh, tomorrow. I mean, he's going to have initial appearance in front of a magistrate tomorrow morning at some point, whenever, depending on whenever they have the, um, the, wherever they do the initial appearances or whatever time they do them. But typically, I'm mo a lot of places it's in the morning um, on a, at the district court. I have a question. Yeah. What if Diddy's, well, this is what I've kind of heard I went about, but what if Diddy's son, if I goes over to the crib that were underage, and when they were over there, maybe after a couple of days, things happened. Would they be considered accomplices at that point? Yeah. Yeah, if they're inviting underage girls over? Because yeah. I know a girl, I know a girl that talks about being there for a couple of days. She's she's over the age though. But I'm just saying like oh, then that's gonna be a lot girls harder, were bro. not. Yeah, I mean if the if the thing is with the feds and human trafficking, when the kid is under eighteen, it's automatic, it's like a slam dunk, it's easy. Once they're of age, then it becomes tougher because now you gotta prove certain things. But what if Diddy's kids are underage too? Like, is that okay? Oh, you're saying like his kids being underage and helping him? Yes. Oh, um, would that's, that come a, that's a good question. So would he he'd get in trouble for that? Yeah, would they get in trouble with the kids if they're underage too as well? I mean, there's probably a state charge for that, like child neglect or something like that. But at a federal level, I don't think the kids, if they're underage, like they're not, the feds really stay away from prosecuting juveniles. Okay. They try their best not to. It's very difficult to prosecute a juvenile at the federal level, at least. Wow. All right. That's yeah, tough, though. Wow. This is, um, you know, it's it's clear, you know, uh, it's clear. Cassie's oh, I, it's, a uh, you should go to New York tomorrow and like go sit in the courtroom if you can. I'm, I'm, His initial appearance. You should. Well, 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 well. Here's the thing. So, so you tell me. So, in this is a sealed case. Is it possibly I'm that right now. is it going to be in an open courtroom? Like we we don't know. Like I yeah, mean, it is. So everything uh, in federal court is is open unless unless it's like a FISA court. No, it's going to be open. We just got to figure out. I'm going to look right now on Pacer and see. Um, obviously the case is sealed right now, but they're going to unseal it. It's just a matter of like figuring out when they do initial appearance. Um, I, 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 I looked on Pacer. It, it, the case isn't there, which, which I'm guessing if it's, if the initial, if the initial indictment isn't there, you just can't find the case, but I'm pretty sure it'll be, it'll appear in the morning, but, but the, there me... isn't a case that originates in the last like week for Diddy. Yo, uh, can you dispel this, this myth, bro? They're saying that we went to the Diddy party, which we did not. Please tell them, bro. Oh, me? Hell no. Nah. They get a fuck. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no. Um, and and I'm gonna be honest with you, is like this is where we're gonna get like so much in more information from this um indictment. All right, but by the way, and, and still continuing off of what you're saying, um, fresh, but but I also want to ask um Myron is like this and you know we see all the time in like these gang or sometimes you know rico cases with with you know gangs obviously mm -hmm. uh we, we see maybe sometimes an indictment then we see a supersede indictment you know sometimes they'll bring more shit into it do we think that whatever indictment that get unsealed tomorrow that's it what he's facing like right or, or are they still maybe trying to cook up something um, that they could try to hit him with or whatever we see on seal tomorrow, that's going to be the mountain that he has to climb. Yeah, no, um, they can absolutely do a superseding indictment. They did it for R. Kelly. Did and they? For the, what, for the, yeah, they did, they did a superseding indictment from, I think, uh, later on. And for the audience that's wondering, a superseding indictment, guys, is nothing more than um, you get him indicted right by the grand jury the first time, and then you can come back. And I know Six Nine did a superseding indictment. Let's say during the course of the investigation, yeah, they added the niggas who kidnapped him. <laughs> exactly. So you can come back and you can do a superseding indictment and charge other conspirators or add charges to it. You convene with the grand jury again. They do another uh, meeting. You indict him again, and you add more charges or add more um, uh, targets. Hey, this is gonna sound like a ridiculous question. How like? Yeah. Um, ballpark me on this, you know, me, classic pocket watcher. Listen, I'm the best when it comes to pocket watching. I love doing it. <laughs> what are we thinking of? Like, I look at the raids. I look at, we got to think the manpower. We're convening the grand jury for like three months. This is Diddy. What do you think the feds are in, in terms, obviously, like we're talking about budget here and resources, but. How much you think they have put behind this case so far? 
couple million easily, bro. Really? I mean, to do a wiretap, to give you guys kind of an idea, to do a wiretap for a month, right, cost about $50,000. Really? So, Damn. Um, and that's just a wiretap, right? But like, um, but it's very expensive to run an investigation between, you know, surveillance, um, doing warrants, going out and interviewing a lot of these witnesses that probably aren't in New York City. You have to go out to other places to interview them. And obviously with a case like this, as a case agent, I want to make sure that I'm out there to do some of these interviews. Um, yeah, they, they've spent, you know, doing surveillance, uh, tracking his assets. That's the other thing, too, is they're probably going to try to identify someone like this. They're going to identify his his real assets for forfeiture, right? What they can and can't take. Um, doing the search warrants that, that where they did a multiple search warrants. They did one at, in Miami and they did one in L.A. at the same time. Simultaneous search warrants. Um, the amount of coordinating between two different field offices to do it. Actually, three field offices because New York ran the investigation. You have to send a collateral case to Miami. Then you got to send a collateral case to L.A. So off rip, I already know that they got three open investigations on Diddy in three different jurisdictions and three different field offices. And that's three different AUSA's offices that are dealing with it as well because you have to get search warrants in those jurisdictions, which means you have to go through the United States attorney's offices in those different jurisdictions. You can't write a, a judge can't give you a search warrant in the Southern District of New York for a house that's in the Southern District of Florida. You need to go to a judge in the Southern District of Florida to get that warrant signed. So that means more than likely a Miami agent had to swear out the affidavit down here unless the case agent flew down, but he probably did. So yeah, man, we're millions it's of dollars. Probably a lot dude, of easily. flights and shit, right? What was that? Sorry, I said it's probably a lot of flights and shit, right? Wow. Oh yeah, dude. For a case like this, the the, the case, they were probably flying all over the country to um to interview witnesses and everything like this because this case is a what I would call like more of a historical case. So it's going to be heavily reliant upon witness testimony, which means you got to track these motherfuckers down, find out where they're at, interview them, do multiple interviews, make sure you get the story straight. Um, you know. You're preparing them and everything else like that, so you know it, it's it's um it's it's going to be tough. And then obviously they're doing great. They're they've had the grand jury convened for months now for this particular investigation, bringing witnesses in, right? Because we know that they've had this grand jury open now for a few months, yeah. and they and I assume that was predominantly to get a lot of these witnesses in to give their testimony so that they can get a true bill of indictment. Hey, humor me for a second, and I'm gonna be a little bit into the conspiracy theory lane, but I'll just ask a question that I've seen people ask before. What is the possibility that, you know, okay, Diddy could possibly, you know, okay, he's taken into custody, but he could probably wiggle and squeeze his way out of this by saying, hey, I got a bigger fish for y'all to fry. Hey, have you heard about my boy Sean Carter, Jay-Z, Jigga Man, or I, I'm not saying that him, but anybody, like just somebody else that, that y'all could be like, I could throw somebody else under the bus to, for you to get me out of the this shit. Hey, you ever heard of Clive David? Like, it, do you think that possibly the feds will be down to say, hey, Diddy, I think you could give us a bigger fish? Or are we saying, nah, Diddy's a big fish enough? It would look crazy if they gave him a deal to give up somebody else. Sure. Uh, and I can explain this because this is kind of a more nuanced question when it comes to informants and, you know, hierarchy and stuff like that. So typically when you open up a case, right, you open up a case under what's called a file title, right? It's going to be your main target and then at all, right? Which means basically him and whoever else is involved. Guaranteed this case is probably Sean Combs at all. He's the main guy and then everyone falls underneath him, right? Uh, if you look at the 6ix9ine case, it was, um, was it Mel Murray was the top guy? Oh, yeah, um, no, no, actually, you're right. You're right. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. His real name, I forget his real name, Jamel or something like that. Mel Murder was his, was his name. But the case title in 6 ix case was Mel Murder. So here, this is how it works when it comes to informants. So I'll give you guys kind of a, a, a thing for your audience here. If you're going to cooperate with the government, if you're going to cooperate and you're going to be an informant, etc., you better not be the fucking top guy because more than likely when you're the top guy, they're not going to cut you a deal because you're the file title, you're the main dude. Unless you have some crazy fucking person that you're going to give up, maybe it's a dirty cop, a dirty op, a dirty agent, some shit like that, not a dirty politician. It's very unlikely that you're going to get time off when you're the file title. Now, what it, what I will say is, and this is why 6 9 got such a great deal, 6 9 was what I would call like the sweet spot, right? He was in a position of power, but he wasn't so high up where he couldn't necessarily work a deal, but he was also not so low where he didn't know the inner workings of the gang. Since he was the rapper and the guy that made the money, 
he was in the right smack dab in the middle where he was rubbing elbows with all the top dudes, so he knew what was going on at the upper echelon. But at the same time, he knew the guys on the lower level. He was able to give information on them. That's why he was able to give information on, you know, uh, was it Kuda? Right, could it be yeah, yeah. and get time off despite him giving an order for him to go shoot at Chief Keith. And he was also get, able to give information on the guys that were above him. And that knocked off his senses significantly because he was in the perfect position since he dealt with the money. And this is typically winds up happening whenever you're doing a criminal investigation. The guys that deal with the money almost always are some of the best informants because they're dealing with all different components of the organization. Because when you're the financier, you got to deal with everybody. So he was in that great spot. To give people above them and below them. But when you're the top guy, it's very difficult to get a deal and uh, get cooperation points because you're the file title. Unless you're able to give like some extraordinary target, um, you know, a corrupt individual who's in a position of public trust, it's going to be very difficult for you to get time off. Wow. And by the way, chat, uh, you guys see as posted on DJ Academics TV, the Instagram and the Twitter account says USA Damian Williams, which is the U.S. attorney. Uh, he said earlier this evening, federal agents arrested Sean Combs based on a sealed indictment filed by the Southern District of New York. We expect to move to unseal the indictment in the morning and we'll have more to say at that time. By the way, here's the thing. I don't know if you've seen this and shout out to my boy Aiden. I know Aiden's probably hitting my phone right now, but um, he's live right now with Sneeko. I think this is Convy, Cuffham and Fousey. And Fousey supposedly said that one of his boys went to a Diddy party and they invited him to Diddy's room where I guess Fousey's friend claimed that, and, and, and I'm sorry to be bringing other people's names into this, but Man. it says Trigger Trey, AKA Trey songs was straddling and sitting on Diddy's lap, making out with him. Let me just play this real quick. I think you guys should be able to hear. I it. could it's say something like about a Diddy party right now, but I don't know the rules of the game. If I'm allowed to say it, say it, you'll be okay. Um, one of my boys, a social media influencer. This was early, back in like 2018. What's one of your boys? I'm not gonna expose him because he says some viable shit. But he was at a Diddy party, and they invited him to Diddy's room. He walks in. Trey Songs was sitting on Diddy's lap, making out with him, and they asked him if he wanted to join. What the fuck? That gotta be no. Ain't no way. Ain't no. They're way. all gay. They're all undercover gays. I promise you that. Sure, that's crazy. I promise Jesus. you that. That is crazy. I could say something. Like wait, wait, wait. That is crazy, bro. Oh my god! <laughs> Yo, what the fuck? I don't know what the hell's going on anymore. Not trick or tray, man. Yo, Not trick or tray, bro. Okay, so how do you draw the line? And and, and, and I want you to keep your investigator hat on. Sure. How do you draw the line between? Okay, this is industry because here's the thing. There's been a lot of you know. It's so funny. That half of these niggas love Diddy parties. And then you'll hear you hear some like, oh, we just never seen that, whatever. But it's like Diddy Party is like a spectacle. It's always been in hip hop. If you're an investigator, how do you draw the line between, oh, okay, this is just some harmless fun shit? Or maybe not harmless fun shit, but shit we shouldn't, you know, spend time or expend our energy into our resources trying to like hunt down versus this is the true crime that's happening here like how, how do you pick that out because it yeah. appears oh, that diddy uh, was you know he was non-stop like he was on some take that take that shit yeah um no that's a good question i think i think the biggest thing right and and i'll tell you this from me wearing that hat like you asked before put on keep your investigator hat on um and this is going to sound very fucked up but I would only go after shit that matter from a prosecutorial standpoint, what I can actually prove, right? And some people might say, oh, well, that's messed up, man. But the reality is at the federal level, you have a higher threshold to prove a case and get prosecution and prove it guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Like the feds don't lose for a reason because they take their time and they go after the things that they can actually prove. So in this situation, you know, some dudes, you know, doing some questionable activities, et cetera. Is that going to be as sexy to an AUSA a lot of the times? Probably not. But if you got a female victim who's underage and she's saying that, hey, I was assaulted and I was GR'd, right, by a group of men, well, that's going to be a lot easier to sell to the U.S. Attorney's Office for a prosecution. And at the end of the day, guys, right, um, getting your case accepted by the AUSA's office for prosecution is is uh, is not as easy easy to do as people think it is because they have a lot of discretion what they take and what they don't take. So. Um, you need to go after the things that are tangible, the things that you can prove, and the things that is going to get their attention. Yo, act. Ain't no way you believe that, bro. What? You believe that? Believe what? Trace 
believe that? No way, bro. You don't believe that, do you? I mean, I'm I'm not getting charged, but I, I think I do have the right to 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 to, to be silent. Anything, and I'm gonna just I'm gonna just yeah. Just, no, no. no and, the and, the only reason why, by the way, but I want to expound before anybody say say some weird shit like oh Atkinson. No, I'm gonna be honest with you. Sexually, I've heard many things about many people in this industry. Some and a lot of them happen to be sex symbols. So. There, there, there's, you know, I'd never want to throw nobody under the bus because I don't never want nobody to do that to me. But Trey Songs is a very, very like th there are conversations about him. I won't say illegal, but conversations about him into different things. And I'm not saying he's homosexual. I'm not saying anything else. I'm what I'm saying is that when I hear um, sexually explorative like conversations and it mentions Trey songs or Diddy. I'm not going to be like, this is the first time I've ever heard it. So right. I, I, I can't jump out and be like, Oh, I don't believe I don't know what to believe. Truth be told. Okay. Yeah. Real quick. I just want to tell my people, we got like 13 K on YouTube guys. Come on over uh, on Twitch, switch.tv slash fresh. We're trying to build that thing up. As y'all know, Fresh Fit Podcast, Twitch.tv slash Fresh Fit Podcast. We're having a discussion with uh, Ak, obviously, on this situation, which, Ak, you're asking some really good questions here. Um, you're, like, really making me kind of go back in time, like, okay, what would we do in this situation? Um, but I think it's very important for the audience to know, um, like, my prediction here is that they wouldn't have pursued this case so aggressively and done the multiple state search warrants, um, you know, seize all the items, convene the grand jury, um, I predict that they're probably going to have anywhere between 10 to 30 different witnesses. They wouldn't have done all this and then go ahead and use the R RICO statute, which I predict is what we're going to see in a grand jury indictment tomorrow, um, had they not been sure that they got this guy dead to rights. You know, I, I predict that Diddy's going to have to probably take a plea deal. I know that he's, you know, liquidated a lot of his assets so that he can go ahead and fight this case because not only does he have this criminal case, but he also has a multitude of civil cases going against him. I think this Danny Kane chick just literally just yeah. did a... Um, a civil case against them recently for sexual assault. So, and by the way, I also, and you know, I don't yeah. want, you know, I'm hoping because this is like the high price you pay of being in media. Yeah. There is two individuals that sent over documents to me and I'm not going to publish them or give them any light, but other than this potential mention right here, it, they have served Diddy, two other individuals with, notice to file loss it's like a hey we're going to file a lawsuit but we can start settling and there's people yeah. there's two individuals currently who are at that point and you know yo yo he has about like 20 cases now like on a civil level um and everyone's gonna come because they notice now especially now that he's gotten arrested like be i, I would not be surprised if he doesn't get served with a few more of these because what they're gonna look at it like okay He's not in a position to fight these cases because he's he's going to obviously allocate most of his resources to his criminal defense team. So he's going to be more than likely willing to kind of play ball and give us what we want, a million here, two million here, blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I definitely predict that he's going to, um, you know, more even more people are going to kind of come out the woodwork and try to sue him civilly so they can get a quick payout because he's not going to have the time or the ability or even resources to fight this stuff in court from in a civil case. Okay, let, let me give you two scenarios of... First scenario, if you're Diddy at this point, and, and obviously this goes into, you know, criminal law. So, you know, obviously you have your experience there, but like maybe not be your forte. It, it, is it something where you might be like, hey, listen, for all the civil cases, you guys get pushed to the, the back burner. Everything focuses on the on the criminal. And at worst, if it gets to be too overwhelming, as long as we potentially beat or at least try to neutralize as much as possible the criminal elements. Remember, these are civil cases. You could always file bankruptcy. Yeah. Um, so you're asking me, like, as a former investigator, like, what would we focus on the criminal case? No, no, Is that no, what no. you're asking? Well, well, that's why I said I'm asking you to get into almost, a, 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 you know, um, maybe a, a, a defense attorney or a civil defense attorney hat, like, like a strategist hat. 
If, yeah, if you're yeah. Diddy, what do you do? Do you be like, oh, hey, my, fuck the I civil would, cases, let's focus on to the to the to the criminal defense case. I would allocate all my resources to that because if you go to jail, you're fucked, right? And he's looking at very serious time here, guys. Like he could die in prison if he's convicted of this stuff. I know they gave R. Kelly thirty. So, okay, okay, okay. Oh, by the um, way, could you break that down because because that was a question being asked to me a lot. What is he facing? And, and and I said essentially a life sentence. I'll Google his age now. You could tell me. I don't know if you know off, off the top of your head what what some of these things that we've predicted like hold in terms of potential penalty. But Diddy age. He's currently fifty four years of age. He's gonna turn fifty five in literally two weeks. So two weeks from now, or actually two and a half weeks, he's going to be. 55. No, no, no. no. Yeah. Actually, no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm definitely wrong. Uh, it, it's a month, month and two weeks. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I predict that he's he's going to be facing a significant amount of time here where you he can die in prison, man, easily. Really? Like, uh, yeah. He, I mean, they gave, they Over gave our 10? Let's let's go ballpark. I know we're, we're spitballing here, and I know you 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 love me. Sure. I predict um if he's found guilty, let's okay. Let's go with two scenarios. Let's go. He goes to trial. Yes, he goes to trial. Now, for those that are unaware, when you go to trial, ninety five percent of cases, right, almost always plead out. You almost never go to trial. But if you go to trial and you force the government to prepare for a trial, you're gonna probably deal with the higher end of whatever sentence you know the charges that you're getting hit with come with. So if he goes to trial and loses. There's a very high likelihood he'll get easily somewhere between 20 to 40 years, right? Wow. Um, if he goes to trial for this, if if it's if it's what I'm thinking, racketeering, sex trafficking, etc. Yes, he, he, you know, so low end, 15, higher end, 40, easily, right? If he goes to trial, if he pleads guilty, 10 to 30 in that range. If he pleads guilty, mm. and cooperates. Wow, I, 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 I'm I'm looking at some of these things. Hold on, I'm, and for I'm, him to get any less time than ten, he'd have to give up a, a fucking dirty NYPD officer, or a public official, or or somebody big for him to get less time, because he's gonna he's the main target. So, um, anytime you're the main target of investigation, it's very difficult for you to get time reduced because you're you get hit with a, a sentencing enhancement called um leader organizer of the organization. What about Jay Z? I mean, he would have to give like significant um, stuff that leads to an actual indictment. Mm. So he'd have to like, it's a, it's real, a, real so evidence. From, from what we know, um, in the federal, uh, uh, and by the way, correct me. You can jump in any time. You know, you, you're more well versed than me. It, when it comes to federal, you know, charges and going through the federal process, they have these mandatory minimums that's unlike any other state where the only way at least from my knowledge they could go below would be if you have usually a 5k1 letter and and that's the that's the snitch scarlet letter which means proper proper letter yep yes a queen for a day whatever the case is six nine had a 5k1 letter that allowed the judge to go beyond because six nine was facing, you know, if, if we're thinking about consecutive on some of these things, he was facing like forty six years. Let's explain what a what a proffer is and a, and a five okay. K is, right? Please. So I've done a couple, I've done a million of these, right? So a proffer for you guys that are wondering, or safety, it's also known as a safety valve in drug investigations. Basically, the individuals probably typically been charged or whatever it may be, and they have information that can be beneficial to your investigation that can you know um, lead to other arrests, whatever. You bring the individual in. They sign a proffer letter with their defense attorney, and what happens is they start. They can give you information where it can incriminate them, but it can't be used against them. So they can totally tell you whatever they need to tell you, unless it's like a very, very serious crime of violence or whatever it may be. But most of the time, everything is kind of you know on the table. You're protected. You get almost full immunity for a day, um, and you're able to kind of just say whatever you got to say. By the way, it's However, called queen for a day. Usually, like you know, on a, on a layman's terms type of thing. Some people call it queen for a day, king for a day. That's also another term for it. But it's, all, you know, 5K proper, safety valve, all generally the same thing with little nuanced differences. You come in, you sit with the with the agent and the prosecutor, and then you're there with your defense attorney and you provide this information, you sign a proper letter. However, the deal goes out the window if you do one of two things. A, you lie, right? 
that that's uh, that, that that will mean that it's defunct and then they can actually charge you for those crimes and then b you need to provide substantial um a, assistance they they use the term substantial assistance assistance to the government in the course of the investigation 